Magandang magandang araw muli sa inyong lahat. I am Dr. Jeff Le Reboron and welcome to our Clinical Practicum 101B class. And this time, we will be talking about the systemic changes in the postpartum period. Before we proceed to our main topic, I would just like to give you a little trivia about the difference between the cesarean section delivery and the normal spontaneous delivery when it comes to the amount of blood loss. Alam niyo po ba that there is more blood loss noted among women who delivered via the cesarean section delivery than those who delivered their baby in normal spontaneous delivery. For postpartum women kasi who have given birth via NSD, a normal blood loss is noted to be 300 to 500 ml. However, for CS mothers, there is an expected blood loss of 500 ml up to 1 liter. So mas marami ang dugong mawawala for a woman who will deliver via cesarean section than those who deliver via NSD. One of the more notable uh, blood changes that happen during the postpartum period of the mother who just delivered to her baby is the increase in the level of plasma fibrinogens. Now, what are plasma fibrinogens in the first place? They are compounds in the blood that are responsible for blood clotting. And always remember that postpartum women have elevated amounts of plasma fibrinogen. Bakit? Because during the first uh, weeks of postpartum, there is an active bleeding that happens in the uterus of the mother and that the mother will need to increase the level of plasma fibrinogen in order for blood clotting to occur so that the bleeding will stop. So always remember that plasma fibrinogen are the ones responsible for blood clotting at kailangan ng nanay ito na magkaroon ng marami siyang plasma fibrinogen para po mag-clot yung mga open blood vessels that are seen in the uterus. Okay. Now note that the elevated amounts of plasma fibrinogen in the mother's blood can make her prone to developing blood clots. Okay. And this may become dangerous if they lodge or block the vital blood vessels in the body. So remember na dahil sa maraming ang uh, plasma fibrinogen si mother, there is a possibility of blood clots forming inside her blood vessel. At pag may mga blood clots po sa ating blood vessel, maaaring mag-decrease yung oxygen and blood perfusion sa ating mga vital organs. So the elevated plasma fibrinogen are the reason why some of the postpartum mothers develop stroke cardiopulmonary attacks or respiratory thromboembolism kasi nga yung mga clot ay pupunta sa utak that will cause stroke, cardiopulmonary attack or pwedeng pumunta siya sa puso or lungs and even respiratory thrombosis or this blood clot can go to the lungs thereby konti na lang yung oxygen at blood na pupunta sa lungs ng pasyente. So always remember ha, plasma fibrinogen is very good because it prevents uh, bleeding but it may also become dangerous because it may predispose several um, life-threatening conditions such as stroke, heart attack, or respiratory thromboembolism. Another component that increases during your postpartum period is the amount of WBC, or what we call the white blood cell, in the mother's complete blood count. Always remember that the increased amount of leukocytes and granulocytes, which are types of white blood cells, are usually noted. Now, bakit tumataas po yung leukocytes and granulocytes ng pasyente? Uh, these are components in the blood that pr provide a protective mechanism to guard against infection that may occur after childbirth. Always remember that during delivery, the mother's puerta is being mechanically handled by the doctor. Hinahawakan siya ng uh, doctor with gloves and that can predispose possible infection. So the mother's leukocytes will need to increase along with its granulocyte so that the body will become protected against any emerging infection. Now, another reason why these WBCs are increased during the postpartum period is because of the tremendous amounts of stress that the woman was exposed to. Always remember that these leukocytes and granulocytes increase if there is a stress that happens in the body. So they increase because they prevent infection and also they increase to guard 
or to promote healing. So, lagi nyo pong tatandaan ha. If there is WBC, which are the soldiers of the body, it means that the body is trying to protect itself from any possible infection and also to promote healing. Now, remember that since the patient is prone to having infection, some mothers may also be given antibiotics after childbirth to also help the leukocytes and granulocytes or your WBC to prevent postpartum infection. And ang pinaka-common po na drug of choice during this time is cephalexin. This is the drug of choice to prevent postpartum infection. Aside from the blood counts that changes during the postpartum period, makikita din natin ang urinary system changes in the body of the mother during postpartum. At alam nyo ba na during pregnancy, there is an estimated increase of 2,000 to 3,000 ml or approximately 2 liters to 3 liters of excess fluid that are accumulated in the woman's body. So meaning, itong fluids na ito, they are lodged in the woman's body and the mother cannot expel these fluids. So saan sila pumupunta? Usually, these fluids, excess fluids in the body, are lodged on the lower extremity and the face of the pregnant mother. That's the reason why it is normal for us to see women who have edematous lower extremities or edematous face. Yung minsan tinatawag natin silang manas na mamanas. That is because of the excess amounts of fluid that are not excreted by the body. At gaano karami yon? It's 2 liters to 3 liters during pregnancy. Now, the maternal hormones kasi are usually sodium and water retaining. Anong ibig sabihin nito? The maternal hormones make it difficult for the body to excrete these excess fluids. So the pregnant woman will retain water. And as a consequence, they have edema to slower extremities due to these hormones. So kaya nga bumibigat po si nanay and it is usually because of the presence of excessive fluids during the pregnant period. Now always remember that Normal human beings like us who are not pregnant usually urinate 1,500 ml of fluids per day. So, umiihe tayo ng isang litro at kalahate sa isang araw. However, for a postpartum mother, they may void up to 3 liters of fluids per day, especially on the first 2 to 5 days after childbirth. Now, if you ask me kung bakit sobrang dami ng kanilang iniihe, it is because of the presence of excessive fluids that they have accumulated during pregnancy. Kung naaalala nyo kanina, sinabi natin that the mother will have an excess of 2,000 ml to 3,000 ml of fluids during pregnancy. Ngayon po, na hindi na siya buntes, she will have to urinate this excessive fluids. Kaya nga po, on the second to the fifth day after childbirth, si mother ay iihe ng iihe until ma-reach niya yung 3,000 ml of fluids per day. Next, during the early postpartum period or, the immediate, or immediately after childbirth, the maternal hormones are already diminished. Bumababa na kasi yung sodium and water retaining hormones ni mother. Because, of the, mo because the mother is no longer under the influence of the maternal hormones, the body will excrete the excessive water as rapidly as it can. Kaya nga po si mother, magkakaroon siya ng 3,000 ml of fluids na maie-excrete or iu-urinate per day because she is no longer under the influence of these maternal hormones. Now, during postpartum period, you can anticipate that the mother, since she is no longer under the influence of the maternal hormones, she will void or urinate the excessive fluids that she has accumulated during pregnancy. Now, for NSD mothers, on the first day of postpartum period, they may feel a decreased ability to sense when she has to urinate, meaning hindi niya alam kung kailan, siya gust kailan niya gustong umihe. This is caused by the pressure of the contracting uterus to the urinary bladder during, during childbirth. Anong, sab anong ibig sabihin nito?
It is vital for us midwives to determine the urinary function of the patient during the postpartum period because we have to remember that the full bladder prevents uterine involution. As stated earlier, the uterus contracts to facilitate its return to its pre-pregnant state. However, because the uterus and the urinary bladder are situated close to each other at dahil nga magkadikit lang sila, the full urinary bladder may hinder the uterus to contract properly. And this will lead to postpartum bleeding and delayed uterine involution if the uterus is not allowed to properly contract. Why? Because the blood vessels where the placenta was attached will remain actively bleeding. So, it is important for us midwives to monitor that the patient is already voiding or urinating on the first two days of postpartum so that we are assured that the uterus will involute properly. Another concept that is present on the first day of postpartum is diaphoresis. We can see this on our patients af immediately after they deliver to their newborn baby. On the first day of postpartum, the mother may have difficulty initiating voiding or urination. The mother may have difficulty urinating because of the presence of anesthesia for CS mothers or because of the pressure of the gravid uterus to the urinary bladder during childbirth. So, one mechanism of the body to control the excessive fluid is through excessive sweating. And this is what we call now diaphoresis. This is noticeable in women immediately after childbirth. You can notice that the mother after giving birth will be sweating profusely. And it is one way to control excessive fluid because the mother will have difficulty of urinating on the first hours. However, it is very vital for you to advise the mother to shower. There are some cultures out there which believe in tangad or the mother should not uh, take a bath for two weeks and that may cause infection. Especially, we know for a fact that the mother has experienced diaphoresis on the first days of postpartum. So we have to advise the mother to shower so that this sweat will not be the breeding ground of microorganisms that will cause infection. One of the midwifery responsibility that we have in terms of the urinary system changes that we see in postpartum is to assess the abdomen. We have to palpate the abdomen and assess it immediately after childbirth. We have to see if the bladder is full. Because if it is full, it might hinder the uterus to return to its pre-pregnant state. The full bladder might prevent the uterus from contracting. So we have to palpate it just above the symphysis pubis as a firm or hard mass. So if we palpate it, it would, if we touch the abdomen of the mother and we feel a firm or hard mass above the symphysis pubis, that will give you an idea of the urinary bladder which is already full of urine. When pressure is applied on the full bladder, the woman may express a desire to void. She may say, I want to go to the CR. So that will also give you an idea that the urinary bladder is already full. Another way of assessing the fullness of the urinary bladder is percussing the bladder. So how do we do this? We place one of our fingers flat on the woman's abdomen and then we tap it with the middle finger of the opposite hand. During the tapping, we listen to the sound created during the percussion. A full bladder will sound resonant. In Ilocano, it's natibong. An empty bladder will have a dull, thudding sound. So for you to be able to understand how percussing the bladder is done, this is how we do it. As you can see, the midwife is placing her non-dominant hand, one of her fingers, on the abdomen, just slightly above the symphysis pubis. And then the other hand, which is the dominant hand, will be tapping that finger and will help us to create sounds. A full bladder will sound resonant, while an empty bladder will have a dull, thudding sound. So if you percuss your patient's abdomen and when you hear a resonant sound, 
that means that the mother's urinary bladder is already full and that the uterus might have difficulty going back to its pre-pregnant state. Now, after assessing the urinary bladder of the patient, after palpating and you found a firm round mass, and after doing percussion, you noticed a resonant sound. That means that the bladder is already full. You have to report this condition to the doctor. The patient might be given diuretics uh, by the doctor, and these diuretics are medications that promote urination. Uh, however, the doctor may also order straight catheterization to the mother to relieve and drain the bladder of urine. So, what does this mean? That you might have to insert a catheter, which is a silicon tube, inserted in the urinary meatus, and then it will connect to the urinary bladder and that this silicon tube will now drain the presence of the urine in the urinary bladder. For you to better visualize it, this is how we do the straight. Immediately after the delivery of the child, the mother might initially say she is hungry or thirsty. Now, you have to remember that this gastrointestinal phenomenon is normal. It is normal for a woman to feel hungry and thirsty right after delivery because of a couple of uh, reasons. Number one reason she fe of feeling hungry is because of the long periods of restricted diet and fluid intake. You have to remember that before delivery, the mother is advised to have a diet of NPO. When we say NPO, it means nothing per orem or nothing should be eaten or drunk by the mother before, before delivery. Aside from that, the mother will feel thirsty because of the profuse bleeding she experiences or what we call diaphoresis. Always remember that on the first 24 hours after delivery, the mother will expel these excessive fluids via the skin because of uh, through profuse sweating. So what will happen? Because of the loss of fluids, the mother will also become thirsty. Therefore, fluid intake is sought by the mother. Now, always remember that women can be given anything that she wants to eat after delivery. However, you have to be careful of giving food and drinks to women who are having nausea and vomiting. You have to remember that they should be allowed to eat or drink, but they should be fed through the small frequent feeding scheme. What do we mean by this? The woman can eat or drink anything that she wants as long as she does not completely fill up her stomach to the point of distension. In Tagalog, pwede niyang kainin lahat ng gusto niyang kainin, pero hindi siya pwedeng magpaka-busog. Bakit? Because if the mother's stomach is distended, that predisposes her to suffer from nausea and vomiting. However, for women who delivered via the cesarean section delivery, they are not immediately fed anything after childbirth. Why? Because they might be suffering from the delayed effects of anesthesia, which may also cause nausea and vomiting. And feeding them immediately after childbirth may also cause possible aspiration. Aspiration occurs when the vomitus of the mother, or in Ilocano, the sarwa, is inspired by the mother or she takes it and inhales it and the vomitus goes to the lungs. And that can be a fatal condition. So we do not immediately feed women who are under the effects of anesthesia 
any food or drink because it may cause nausea and vomiting and ultimately it can cause aspiration. Now, remember that CS mothers are usually fed their food and drinks gradually. And what do we do? Number one is we give them clear liquids if and only if their flatus is already passed after surgery. Now, what do we mean when we say flatus is passed? Kung umutut na po si mother, that is the only ta after surgery, that is the only time that we can give clear liquids. Always remember that during cesarean section delivery, the intestines are also mechanically touched. So they are also mechanically manipulated, ginagalaw-galaw din po siya. And because of the surgery, the normal positioning of the intestines have been modified. So we have to make sure that the intestines are already on their proper place by waiting for the flatus to pass. So hindi po pwedeng painumin ng clear liquids kung hindi pa umuutot si mother. But if the flatus has already been passed by the mother, we can give clear liquids. And when we say clear liquids, these are foods without any residue. Wala siyang fiber, walang any solid material. So, part of our clear liquid will include broth, water, or tea. They may be given if the patient has already passed flatus after delivery. However, if the mother has already passed stool or fecal matter or in Tagalog, kung kumain na po yung pasyente after ng surgery, we can already give them soft diet or what we call the bland diet or the low-fiber diet. Now, these foods are very soft, they are easy to chew, and they are also gentle on the mother's stomach. Now, why do we want these kinds of food to be given to a patient who just undergone cesarean section delivery? The digestive process is hard up because it has been touched by the doctor during the uh, surgery. So it has been mani mechanically manipulated. And we want the digestive process to heal and normalize its processes as much as possible. So we do not want to place any undue stress to the digestive system of the patient. That's the reason why we give them foods that are easy to digest, easy to chew, and that are gentle on the stomach. You have to remember that. Patients may also complain of having hemorrhoids. And what are hemorrhoids? These are distended rectal veins that have been pushed out of the rectum due to maternal efforts during delivery. So kakairi po ng nanay, the blood vessels in the rectum have ballooned and now it has been pushed out by the maternal effort. In Tagalog, these are called almoranas and this is but normal for patients in their postpartum uh, period. Another reason for hemorrhoids is because of constipation. Constipation is the difficulty of passing out stool. And this uh, condition may be caused by, number one, the presence of the hormone relaxin. Relaxin is the hormone that goes into the bowel that leads to the slow movement of the intestines. Therefore, kung mabagal po yung paggalaw ng mga intestines, Ibig sabihin, mabagal din yung pag-move ng fecal matter from one segment of the intestine to another. Therefore, magkakaroon ng impacted stool si patient. So, magkakaroon siya ng constipation dahil sa mabagal na paggalaw ng intestines. Aside from that, another reason why the patient might uh, suffer from constipation during the postpartum period is the presence of episiotomy or laceration. The mother may be reluctant to evacuate her bowels because of her painful laceration or sutures. Always remember na pag tumatae yung isang tao, the, ma the person will need to exert a little effort. But because of the presence of episiotomy, what will happen is that the mother will fear to uh, bear down. Hindi niya gustong umire para mailabas yung tae because she has a fear of opening her episiotomy or laceration. So, pwedeng masakit para sa kanya. So, tendency is ayaw niyang tumae or ayaw niyang umire. So, that will now cause constipation. Aside from that, we also have hemorrhoids. Your hemorrhoids may cause constipation because the presence of the hemorrhoid on the rectal opening may impede the passage of stool. So, those are the normal conditions that may, we may see during the gastrointestinal involution 
during the postpartum period makakakita tayo ng hemorrhoids because of the recta uh, the uh, rectal veins that are ballooned because of the pushing of the mother we can also note for the presence of constipation because of the presence of relaxin episiotomy or laceration na pwedeng mag-cause ng pain habang tumatay si mother or the presence of hemorrhoids now what can we do as midwives when we are taking care of these kinds of patients Number one is we have to assess before giving oral intake. What do we mean by this? So pag sinabi ng pasyente na siya ay gutom or siya ay nauuhaw, we do not immediately give them food or drinks. We have to look for signs of nausea and vomiting. Kasi nga, pag pinakain mo yung patient na may nausea and vomiting, maaaring magkaroon siya ng aspiration. The patient might inhale her vomitus and that may lead her death. So, we have to ensure that the patients have not been also given gen general anesthesia before giving uh, the mother any type of food or drink. So, number one, dapat tignan mo na wala siyang signs and symptoms of nausea and vomiting. And number two, make sure that the patient has not been given any anesthesia. So, pag na-check mo na yon, you go to the patient's chart and refer to the doctor's order and look for the presence of the order of that patient's diet. Ma ka, ma nakasulat naman doon po sa chart ng pasyente, uh, patient is for NPO or patient is for clear liquid. So you have to refer to the doctor's order before giving the woman any food intake so that you can prevent any possible or untoward complications. Next, for patients with constipation, you should advise the mother to eat fruits and vegetables that are high in fiber, or in other words, it's roughage, okay? So you feed them uh, those kinds of foods so that it will trigger the movement of the uh, intestines because it increases the bulk of the fecal matter. You also encourage the mother to drink uh, more liquids or fluids and ambulate or do light exercises. So dapat kumakain siya ng rich in fiber, umiinom siya ng maraming tubig, naglalakad-lakad or gumagawa ng light exercises because the fluids and fibers soften the stool will, while ambulation and light exercises will also facilitate the return of the normal movements of the intestine. So, always remember, high fiber, increase fluid intake, ambulate or light exercises for constipation. Now, another concept that you have to properly grasp in the gastrointestinal changes in postpartum is the idea of weight loss. There is an estimated 19 pounds or 8 to 10 kilograms of weight loss during the postpartum period. And bakit gumagaan ng ganito kadlake yung mother after the delivery? Now, always remember that the woman becomes lighter on the earlier stages of postpartum because of the weight loss coming from the delivery of the fetus, the placenta, the funis, the amniotic fluid, and around 300 to 500 ml of maternal blood. So, on the first few minutes of postpartum pa lang, pag lumabas na po yung mga products of conception, the mother will already become 12 pounds lighter. On the second day of postpartum, there will also be a weight loss that is noted and that will amount to 2 to 4 kilograms. So saan manggagaling yung weight loss na yon? It will be caused by diuresis or the frequent urination of the mother starting from the second to the fifth day after postpartum and also the diaphoresis. Di ba po nga si mother ay sweat ng sweat? There is a profuse sweating on the part of the mother and dahil dito, nababawasan ng timbang si nanay ng 2 to 4 kilograms on the second day of postpartum. Aside from that, the lochial flow, which are the decidua, which pre presents itself as a menstrual flow, will also amount to approximately 2 to 3 pounds or 1 kilogram of weight loss during the postpartum period. So you can expect that the mother will continuously lose weight during the postpartum period because she is already losing the fluids that she retained during pregnancy and she already lost most of the uh, products of conception. Now, 
when we talk about the skin changes in the postpartum mother, we, you have to remember that the cloasma will become less visible until the sixth week of postpartum. So in the first two months, during the postpartum period, the cloasma or the discoloration on the face of the mother will still become visible. But by the end of the sixth week of postpartum, they will already be start to lighten. We also have the striae gravidarum, which are the stretch marks that are found on the woman's abdomen because of the distension or the increase in size of the uterus. They are reddened and they may become even more prominent after childbirth. And sadly, the striae gravidarum or the stretch marks found on the abdomen will not disappear. However, the linea nigra or the discoloration in the middle abdomen caused by pregnancy will lighten like the cloasma and will only disappear six months after childbirth. So contrary to the cloasma which will disappear six weeks after childbirth, in your linea nigra, it will only disappear six months after childbirth. Aside from the systemic changes, you will be also noting the different vital signs changes in the woman on their postpartum period. Now, remember that the temperature of the woman will become elevated on the first 24 hours. And why will it become elevated? It is because of dehydration and strenuous maternal effort. Dahil nga sa napagod si nanay nakakaire and because of diaphoresis or uh, profuse sweating, it is normal to see a patient with, uh, who has an elevated temperature. Within the first 24 hours, that is considered normal. However, if the elevation of temperature is already more than 24 hours, kunwari your patient is 38 degrees centigrade and that the patient is already on her second day of postpartum, that is already considered febrile. That is no longer normal. And that may be a sign of postpartum infection. You have to note as well that during the fourth day of postpartum, the mother may experience elevation of temperature again. Bakit magkakaroon siya ng elevation of temperature? Because on the fourth day of postpartum, the breast of the mother will do double time. 
So it will exert effort to produce more milk. And because of that, the mother might experience engorgement. Sobrang lalaki yung susu ni nanay and it will cause distension on the breast tissues, which will cause pain to the mother. And that now will also uh, signal an elevation of the temperature. However, if the fever does not go away after a few hours, there is likely to become infection. Because on the fourth day, the fever or the elevation of temperature should only become temporary. Pero pag hindi po nawala yung fever niya on the fourth day at nagpersist siya, that is already a sign of infection. Now, what do we do if we have patients with fever? Number one, you have to monitor and record their temperature. And you have to bear in mind that the increase in temperature on the first 24 hours is normal. But after 24 hours and your patient still has an elevated temperature, you have to already report it to the doctor so that the doctor can prescribe antipyretic medications to your patient. So that is number one thing that you should do as a midwife. You have to monitor and record the body temperature of the patient. Aside from that, you have to prevent breast engorgement. We have discussed a while ago that on the fourth day, the breast will continuously produce milk on the fourth day of life and therefore the mother will have increased temperature on that fourth day. So what do you do when you want to prevent breast engorgement? We do not want the breast of the mother to become distended. Ayaw nating sobrang lumaki nun dahil sa punong-puno ng gatas because that will be very uncomfortable and painful for the patient. So what do we do? We have to advise the mother to breastfeed her child and to prevent the breast from stretching beyond its limit. Engorgement kasi occurs when there is too much milk in the breast of the mother. So what do you do? Aside from letting the baby suck on the breast para hindi naman mapuno yung breast ng nanay, you have to advise the mother to place warm compress on the affected breast. Bakit warm compress? Because this will help relieve the pain being experienced by the mother who has breast engorgement. As discussed a while ago, we have discovered that the elevation in temperature of a postpartum mother may also be caused by dehydration and exhaustion. Dahil sa uhaw na uhaw si mother because of the NPO order of the doctor, and dahil sa pagod na pagod siya because of bearing down, the mother may have increased temperature because of these two reasons. So immediately after childbirth, the mother might feel thirsty and might want to ask a glass of water. Do we give the mother water immediately? Yes, but we have to take into consideration her condition. So we have to encourage oral fluid intake for most mothers, but for mothers who are nauseated, we do not give fluids immediately because it may cause them to vomit and they may also cause aspiration or the fluids enter the lungs of the mother. Yung vomitus, ma-inhale ni mother and that will be very dangerous for the patient. So no immediate uh, drinking for patients who are nauseated. Aside from that, we also defer giving food and drinks to patients who have undergone cesarean section or painless delivery or epidural delivery. Why? Because these types of patients have been given anesthesia. And you have to remember that the effects of anesthesia may be vomiting on the next 3 to 4 hours after the administration of the drug. So pagkabigay ng anesthesia, pwedeng after 3 to 4 hours magkaroon ng vomiting si patient. So if you give the patient fluids immediately after the delivery, that may also cause vomiting and therefore may also cause aspiration. So hindi po pwedeng magbigay ng tubig immediately for patients who have undergone cesarean section or painless delivery or epidural delivery. Now, another thing that you can do for patients with fever is give oral antipyretics. And when you say antipyretics, these are drugs which lower the temperature of a patient. So the doctor may, be, may advise the patient to take paracetamol. But be sure that before you give the drug to the patient, that you check the doctor's order. Okay? Because we are not allowed to give medications without the doctor's order. You have to always remember that. 
So those are the things that you can do to your patient. Monitor and then increase fluid intake and then also give oral pyretics and also prevent breast engorgement. So those are the things that we can do to control the temperature of the woman in postpartum. Aside from the temperature changes, there will also be notable pulse changes during the postpartum period. During the first three days of postpartum, the PR or the pulse rate of the mother will become very slow and their normal pulse rate will become 60 to 70 beats per minute. However, after the first week of postpartum, the heart rate will return to its normal functioning. Therefore, the heart rate will now become a normal of 80 to 100 beats per minute. So what is our midwifery responsibility? Number one is we have to monitor the pulse rate and that the, we should evaluate the pulse rate honestly and effectively. Because there are, mid, there are midwives out there who do not really give attention to the pulse rate of the mother. What they do is they just take the pulse rate for 15 seconds and then multiply it by 4 to give a 1 minute reading. And that should not be. Because evaluating the pulse rate of the mother can also help you determine the presence of postpartum hemorrhage. How? A fast and a thready weak pulse may indicate that the woman is already suffering from bleeding. So you have to monitor the pulse rate of the patient so that you can look into the quality of the pulse. If it is fast, it is weak, then that may indicate bleeding. So you have to monitor the pulse rate honestly. Aside from monitoring the patient's pulse rate, you have to compare the pulse rate effectively. Like I said a while ago, the normal pulse rate for a postpartum patient on the first three days is 60 to 70 beats per minute. And you have to consider that. That should be your point of comparison when you are comparing the pulse rate of your patient in the normal. For example, your patient has a pulse rate of 82 beats per minute. So if you do not compare it effectively and you just compared it to the normal uh, pulse rate that is 80 to 100 or 60 to 100 beats per minute according to other books, you may think that the patient has a normal pulse rate because 82 falls between 60 and 100. However, if you compare it to the normal range of a postpartum patient, which is 60 to 70 bits per minute, the reading that you got, which is 82 bits per minute of pulse rate, is already considered high. Therefore, the patient is already tachycardic and that patient may already be showing signs of bleeding. Again, remember to compare the pulse rate effectively. For, for patients within the first three days of postpartum, the normal pulse rate is 60 to 70. However, for patients uh, who are not postpartum, the normal is 60 to 100 or some books even say it's 80 to 100. But what is important is that you remember that on the first three days, the normal pulse rate is 60 to 70. The blood pressure of the mother should also be carefully and honestly assessed by the midwife. Because depending on the reading that you can get during your checking of the blood pressure, it will indicate the condition that is happening in your patient. For example, your patient is having hypotension or a very low blood pressure. That may now indicate postpartum bleeding or postpartum hemorrhage. Why? Because one of the signs and symptoms of, hyp uh, of hypovolemic shock is hypotension or a BP that may be lower than usual. So if you have a BP that is low compared to the normal of the client, that may already indicate bleeding because hypotension or low BP is already a sign of hypovolemic shock. However, if your patient has a systolic blood pressure of more than 140 millimeters per mercury, and a diastolic BP of more than 90 millimeters per mercury. For example, your patient has 140 over 90 mmHg of BP. 
that is already a sign of delayed hypertensive complication during puerperium and usually that is caused uh, that is called your postpartum eclampsia so pag mataas po yung bp that means that the patient is having postpartum preeclampsia and if the bp is low that means that the patient is having hypovolemic shock or signs of bleeding Another thing that you have to consider while checking the blood pressure of the mother is noting if the patient has been given uterotonic drugs because most of the time, these uterotonic drugs like your oxytocin and methergine are given to promote uterine contraction. However, these drugs also cause hypertension. So, they stimulate the contraction of all the smooth muscles in the body, including the blood vessels. And when they, these blood vessels contract, this will cause the increase in blood pressure of the mother. So what is being said or what is our lesson when it comes to the uteronotonic drugs? Number one is that oxytocin and methergine both promote uterine contraction. However, they also have the side effect of increasing the BP of a patient. So, what is your midwifery responsibility? Before giving any uterotonic drug to your patient, always double-check the BP. Why? Because if the patient has already elevated blood pressure, mataas na po yung BP, and you still introduce your uterotonic drug, it will cause uterotonic-induced hypertension. Mas tataas pa yung BP Kasi nga mataas na nga yung BP, binigyan mo pa ng oxytocin na nagpapataas ng presyon. So you have to double check the blood pressure before giving any uterotonic drug. Now another uh, blood pressure change that is rampant during the postpartum period is what we call your orthostatic or positional hypotension. Anong ibig sabihin nito? This is the dizziness that occurs on standing due to the lack of adequate blood volume to maintain the nourishment of the brain cells. Always remember that during childbirth, there is a loss of 300 to 500 ml of blood. And what happens? When the mother immediately stands up, the gravitational force will pull all the blood down. Therefore, kokonti na lang po yung blood na pupunta sa brain and that, na, that will now cause your positional or orthostatic hypotension. I know for a fact that you have already experienced this. Kunwari naglalaba kayo, and then you are squatting on the floor while washing your laundry, and then you immediately stood up. When you feel a little tingling on your uh, eyes, and you also feel na nagbablackout kayo, or medyo nagkaroon kayo ng dizziness because of the sudden change of position, that is what it feels to have orthostatic or positional hypotension. Bakit? Kasi sa biglang pagtayo nyo, the blood volume goes down because of gravity. Pupunta sila sa paa. Kokonti na lang po yung puputang brain sa utak. Therefore, magkakaroon ka ng dizziness. Now, is it dangerous? Basically, your orthostatic or positional hypotension is not that dangerous. However, yung consequence niya ang mas nakakatakot. This condition kasi predisposes the postpartum mother to accidents like fall, trauma to the head, or uh, mababaguk yung ulo niya somewhere because of the dizziness. So you have to double check for the patient for signs of orthostatic hypotension. Now that we know the different blood pressure changes that happen in the postpartum period, we have to know the different midwifery responsibilities that we have in connection to the topic. And number one, midwifery responsibility is evaluating the BP effectively. What do you mean by this? You always have to compare the woman's blood pressure with her pre-pregnant level, if possible. And you have to not compare the blood pressure of the woman to the normal range of the general population. Anong ibig sabihin ito? hindi mo dapat compare yung normal na blood pressure ng nanay sa normal blood pressure ng karamihan. 
And what is the normal blood pressure of the general population? It's 120 over 80 millimeters per mercury. Now, what do you mean? I, let's give, I'll give you an example so that you will understand this effectively. Kunwari, you have a patient who is already postpartum and she has a reading of 120 over 80 millimeters per mercury. When you compare it to the normal BP of the general population, sasabihin mo normal yon, kasi 120 over 80. However, if you compare it to her normal BP before she gets pregnant, in this case, for example, 90 over 60 millimeters per mercury yung dating BP ng nanay, then you know very well that the BP na 120 over 80 na nakuha mo kanina is not considered normal but hypertensive. Therefore, it should be reportable to the, page, to the resident on duty. Ulitin natin ha, you should compare the blood pressure of the woman to her pre-pregnant BP and not to the normal range of the general population. Meaning, hindi po yung 120 over 80 ang gagamitin nating basis ng normal BP, kundi yung dating normal na BP ni nanay before she got pregnant. And that is the importance of having uh, pre-pregnancy consultation to your patient. Another thing that we should consider regarding the BP of the mother is to always check the BP before giving any uterotonic drug. I have already discussed it to you a while ago, and now I will just give an example. Supposing your patient has a BP of 140 over 90 millimeters per mercury, and you have a standing order to give oxytocin to your patient, what do you do? You already noted that the BP is elevated, and you know very well that when you give this uh, oxytocin to your patient, the BP might elevate again. So what do you do? Defer, and you report the condition to the, uh, to the uh, doctor so that the doctor will know what to do. Why? Because if you continue to give the oxytocin to a patient with a BP of 140 over 90 millimeters per mercury, that will elevate the BP. And what will happen? It might... Uh, lead to the occurrence of cerebrovascular accidents or stroke or even heart attack. So you have to double check the BP before giving any uterotonic drugs. Another midwifery responsibility is checking for orthostatic or positional hypotension. So how do we check if the woman has positional hypotension, paano natin malalaman na pag bumangon si mother ay hindi, siya, hindi bibiglang bababa yung kanyang BP at mahihilo siya? What do we do? Number one, you have to assess the patient's pulse rate and BP while she is in supine position. So habang nakahiga si nanay, you check the pulse rate and the BP. What do you do next? You raise the head of the bed fully upright, so nakasitting position na si mother. And you wait for two to three minutes. After placing the patient on that upright position or sitting position for that next two to three minutes, you again check the BP and the pulse rate of the patient. If there is an increase of 120 beats per minute in the pulse rate, kung tumaas yung kanyang pulse rate ng 20 beats per minute, or kung nagkaroon ka ng drop, of 15 to 20 millimeters per mercury in the BP of the mother, kunwari bumaba yung kanyang BP ng sitting, pag sitting position na siya, that is already indicative of positional hypotension. So si mother, pag bumangon yan, there's a possibility na babagsak yung BP niya, mahihilo siya, and she will be predisposed to suffering from fall or head injury. After monitoring the patient and checking if she is susceptible to having positional hypotension, the next thing that you are going to do is advise the woman to prevent positional hypotension. So, anong gagawin natin? We have to teach the mother to not change position very rapidly, especially when she is rising from her bed. Mother, hindi po pwedeng agad-agad bumabangon kayo at nagchichange ng position because that will lead to the collapse of your BP. Pwede kang mahilo, pwedeng mabagok yung ulo mo kung nawalan ka ng 
malay. So what are we going to advise to this patient? Number one is we tell her to sit up slowly. Dahan-dahang uupo sa kanyang bed. And then she has to dangle her feet on the side of the bed for a few minutes after attempting to walk. Later on, I will show you a picture of a feet that is dangling so that you will have an idea of how this is done. So dapat dahan-dahan ang pag-upo and then dangle her feet on the bed for a few minutes before attempting to walk. Next, you also have to instruct her to note for dizziness when she is sitting upright. Mrs., pag kayo po ay umuupo, wala kayo dapat nafe-feel na pagkahilo. Pero pag meron po kayong nafe-feel na pagkahilo, huwag muna kayong tatayo because that will cause you to have dizziness and positional hypotension. Aside from that, you have to include the significant others of the patient in the care. You have to teach the husband or the mother or the brother of the patient to assist them and support them during ambulation. You have to tell them the dangers of positional hypotension. Sabihin mo, ma'am, sir, yung pasyente po kasi pwede siyang biglang mahilo pag siya ay naglalakad, pag nag-change siya ng position. And pwedeng magkaroon siya ng uh, pagkahilo or pwede siyang magkaroon ng pagkahimatay and that will now lead to problem or accident. So dapat po, if the patient is going to the CR, you have to help the patient and assist her during ambulation. So that is one thing that you can do. Teach the patient's significant others during the ambulation of the patient to prevent falls. Next is you also caution the mother to not walk while carrying the newborn child. We know very well that the mother is prone to having collapse or falls because of positional hypotension. So what do we do? We tell her not to carry her newborn if she is uh, walking, especially if she still has hypotensive uh, disorder. Because if it happens that she's carrying her newborn child and then she lost her consciousness, nahulog siya sa floor, nabaguk yung ulo niya, pati yung bata, nabaguk na din. So we tell, her, tell the patient not to walk while carrying her newborn until her cardiovascular functions return to normal. Or kung nawala na yung positional hypotension niya, that's the only time that she can carry her child uh, while walking. And lastly, you have to inform the physician on duty regarding the presence of positional hypotension in the patient. So this is what we call dangling the feet on the side of the bed. And that concludes our discussion for our class. I hope you learned something from our session and I hope you enjoyed my class as much as I did. However, I would uh, like to make an assessment on how much you have learned with our session together. So I will be again uploading a quiz on your Edmodo class. So please bear that in mind. Read your modules, rewatch the video if you need to, and always keep safe, be healthy, stay at home, and stay alive. Maraming maraming salamat for listening.